So, welcome back to Third Age Reforged and to another battle replay and to... I'm not entirely sure where, to be honest with you. Some dank, horrible cave in the foothills of the Misty Mountains, perhaps. Because we are going to be seeing three orcish fact No, not three. Four, I should say, orcish factions. Although there are going to be three goblin factions amongst them, which is what I was trying to say. Going to be on the defence, I suppose, although I guess attack and defence is somewhat of a moot point here because we're going to be seeing more of a flat engagement more than anything else. I'm not entirely sure what to make of this battle as a whole, to be honest with you, and how it's going to be structured, but we're also going to be seeing three elven factions joined by one force from Cardlum, who are going to be trying to root out this foul nest of evil today on this battle. And it's not going to be as long a battle as the ones that we have seen in Reforged recently. There's been plenty of really long sieges, and albeit this isn't a tiny battle by any stretch of the imagination, uh, this is going to be somewhat more of a, a somewhat more violent clash, I would say. Um, that's what you always seem to get with these uh, battles, which have uh, got a lot of players involved, but uh, don't tend to stretch out for all that long. I would imagine this is what's going to be the case here. Now, this one was sent to me by Tommy the Wise, who I'm going to assume, based on the locale, that it is going to be more of an orcish defence, given that this is the sort of place where they would usually inhabit, you'd have to say. I can't imagine that the elves of Imladris are too impressed about being in such a place, but I would not hesitate to guess that it was probably their idea, because I can't imagine that Cardlan would have willingly come to a place like this either. Anyway, we will be starting off with Eclipse 2500, a familiar face who's going to be playing as one of the elves uh, of Imladris' armies. Some swords of Rivendell and some spears of Rivendell on the front line, which considering they are going up against the orcs, these are the kind of units which can be really, really efficient, provided they can get into a good melee fight. Now, I would say that Angmar are going to be a little bit different to the Misty Mountains here, in the sense that Angmar are certainly a more robust faction in terms of the individual units they can field. So it isn't going to be quite so simple for Imladris to be able to utilise their quality as it might be in a choke point against the Misty Mountains, but we shall have to wait and see. And this is a rather wide section of the battlefield anyway, so uh, the orcish numbers could be a bit of a problem for Imladris, we shall have to wait and see. One area, of course, in which the Elves and the Kingdom of Men are going to have a significant advantage on this field today, or in this cave today, I should say, is going to be at range, because Angmar, of course, are the worst archer faction in the game, and the Misty Mountains, all of their ranged pressure really will come from units like crossbows, which, while very useful in a setting like this, um, overall the long-range advantage is still going to be held by the Elven and human factions on the field. Noritino Warriors have also got that extra bit of utility in the fact that they are pretty good in melee for the tier of unit that they are as well, when they pull out their dual axes, in some cases some of them wielding knives as well. So Eclipse thinking ahead perhaps, and he's also got a unit of standard Archers of Rivendell, which at range, very very similar to the Noritino Warriors, they just don't have the same abilities in melee. Um, but yeah, a very full skirmish line he's got here, but not an overly expensive skirmish line either, because he knows he doesn't need to invest tons and tons to be able to outperform Angmar at range. Noritino Cavalry also very basic as far as cavalry goes, but again they could be enough to do the damage they want. I probably wouldn't have brought them in this sort of setting though, especially with Angmar and the Misty Mountains on the field. They've got plenty of anti-cavalry options, so Noritino Cavalry, you'll have to use them very sparingly in order to get the best out of them, but perhaps it is possible. And then towards the back we of course have the more elite units in Ladra's Sentries if they can get set. There's really very little that the Orcish faction is going to be able to do about that. I mean, Angmar do have their own pikes to try and answer them with, but they're not as high quality. Um, yeah, Imladris sentries are very, very strong as far as that kind of unit goes. We also have some Imladris guardians at the top, which line infantry-wise, very, very strong as well, albeit Angmar can answer this as well. Again, not quite as high quality, but good enough to the point where it may present a problem. Imladris sentries as well. Don't know if there's going to be any hidden units for Imladris. I would imagine not. Another unit of Noritino Cavalry, so a very atypical army, this. We shall have to wait and see if that proves to be a good thing. The Gwythi Rockdor are also here for Eclipse, though, and this, of course, is a very expensive but potentially extremely devastating unit. Um, as far as all round goes, defense and offense are probably the best unit of knights in the game when you take all into account. Potentially devastating unit there. Now then, we have Lango, who is playing as another Imladris army, of course, looking like he's gone for a little bit more quality. He too has gone from some Imladris guardians and some Imladris sentries. Looks like they're going to make their way over to support Eclipse very quickly, which he may need if Angmar comes barreling forward in a counter-attack. Bruinen Riverwards, Elven Heavy Swordsman, which is why I'm a little bit surprised to not see Eclipse bring any at all, because uh, Elven Heavy Swordsman like this can, of course, be 
very, very effective. We've got some Elder Enway Swordmasters, the higher tier version of that. They're very expensive, but also outside of Bodyguard tier units, you're rarely going to find a unit with stats that are as high as the Elder Enway Swordmasters. In fact, you probably won't straight up. Archers of Rivendell, some Swords of Rivendell as well as a sort of auxiliary force which may be heading through the middle to support his fellow elves over there. And he too has got a unit of Gwythi Rockdor, which will be barreling through the middle of the map as well, which is a little bit on the lower terrain. So some Swords of Rivendell out in front, but Elder Enway Spearmen, Arch of Rivendell, so he's not completely barren here in the middle, um, but he is going to need the support of his allies. Speaking of which, a much denser formation than this from D.F. Morris, who has got some Spears of Rivendell and some Swords of Rivendell on the front, much like Eclipse had, but he too is weaving in some Imladris sentries into this army, looking like a far more quality-centric army, this, because it's far smaller than the one Eclipse is bringing to the field. The God Helene with an armor upgrade, those Silverthorn arrows could be useful. They're more useful when the enemy is advancing towards you. And I feel like certainly Morris is going to have to advance towards the enemy because he's pretty severely downhill. So he's going to have to be fairly aggressive here. Gwythi Rockdor. Will all of these Elven Knights actually be useful in a setting like this? Because while there are wide open spots within this cave, um, they can also be constricted as well. Also Angmar and the Misty Mountains with their own anti-cavalry options. I don't know if they're necessarily going to be the most useful unit. I mean, one or two maybe, but going this heavily into your budget as a team might not be the best idea. Horse archers could be useful as a harassment unit as well, the riders of the Bruinen. I don't know. I mean, there's a lot of quality in this army, but is it in the right place? Would Morris have been better served going for a few more units of heavy infantry, perhaps, rather than going for really expensive horse archers and knights? The same could be said for his allies as well, of course. And finally, I'm sure a more numbers-focused approach from D.F. Mevan He's going to be playing as Cardinal, Plenty of Greenway, Garrison, Spearman. and they'll be able to match the Misty Mountains for numbers much more easily than the Elves will, though of course that says something about the potential quality on display. So some Spearmen there, also Mithiriath Archers. They'll be able to skirmish at long range with the Misty Mountains just fine, and also their crossbows are of higher quality as well, so the ranged game is going to be all theirs, which represents a bit of a problem maybe for the Misty Mountains, in that they may have to go more severely onto the offence over here. Royal Court of House Thorondor, more dedicated heavy lancers than the Gwythi Rockdor, so they're going to have to be even more careful about potential anti-cavalry options on the other side of the field, but we shall see. Warns of Tyr and Gorthav, Menatar, Romain, Gatekeepers, are plenty of crossbows and pikes in here, as you would expect from Cardinal, exactly what you want to do. Pin the enemy in place with a bunch of fairly cheap spears and decent pikes, and then nail them with your crossbows. There are a few good units of infantry Cardinal do have. I mean, mercenary guildsmen need to be careful about routing, of course, but the armor piercing is going to be useful nonetheless against the orcs and goblins they're facing off against. And here he has spears in decent numbers. If you want something a little bit more robust than the greenway spears, then here they are. And much in the same vein, the Minheriath men at arms, who, of course, have got that extra little bit of damage in melee against other infantry units. But again, very run of the mill as far as infantry goes. But it's kind of what you expect from Cardinal run of the mill infantry, but with some exceptional units of skirmishers, particularly crossbows to back them up. Now then, the first of the de facto defenders today, as I've christened them, we have Jen Mumu, who is playing as one of the Misty Mountains Army's Bolg's champions, represent a big threat not only to the Royal Court House Thorondor, but also to the Gwythi Rockdor because of their more anti-cavalry focus, whereas Gwythi Rockdor more of an all-round powerhouse. They may not, I mean, depending on the kind of engagement, the Gwythi Rockdor can still win that fight, but the Bolg's champions are cheaper, and the Gwythi Rockdor represent a far bigger portion of proportion of the uh, Elven army here. Misty Mountains, of course, got plenty of other units they can call upon, including a plethora of heavy goblin halberds here, which will be making up the cost-effective front line. I mean, their armor piercing will be useful against Cardland. The only slight issue will be, from their perspective, that the Cardland pikes can outrange them, and the Cardland missiles can cause them a big problem as well. Speaking of which, missile units will be trying to focus down stuff like the Black Uruks as well, but they are one of the genuinely impressive melee units in terms of what they offer for their tier that the Misty Mounts have to offer, and they're also very, very numerous. Could be a problem for Cardland again if they close into melee, but again, I'm sure that they will be one of the first things that will be focused down. Maybe more of a quality focus here from the Misty Mountains even, as they're also going for the other sort of upper mid-tier unit that the Misty Mountains can field in the Mountain Uruk host, very similar, as I've mentioned several times, to the Uruk High Infantry and what they offer, a heavily armoured unit of Orcs, which should do just fine in this sort of setting, especially against Cardland, because they can straight up out-quality the Minheriath units now, and especially when you back them up with a bit of armour piercing from the Halberds, and here 
from the Heavy Goblin Spears. It's a pretty complete infantry force, this, and it may have to be if they need to take the initiative and attack into Cardolan. Obviously, two routes they can take here either side of the rock formations. Heavy Goblin Crossbows, of course. They're too good not to bring, really, in terms of what they offer to the Misty Mountains. White or Fearmongers, again, like a, an upper-end unit of Halberds like this, is, again, maybe a little bit too tempting to ignore. Probably, yeah, Blackback Mountain Berserkers and Goblin King's Bodyguard, so plenty of quality here. Maybe not as numerous as a goblin army can be, but that might not be the worst idea against a force like Cardinal. Then we have WK, who's bringing some cave trolls to the field. Could be the ideal thing for battering through a meagre elven front line to get to their juicy skirmishes in behind, albeit elven skirmishers can of course defend themselves against cave trolls far better than most can. Plenty of heavy goblin spears and halberds as well, just trying to be that cost-effective, very numerous front line against the elves and ladras as they try to scramble up the hill here. Got some Goblin King's Bodyguard. Goblin Arch is in behind, which is an interesting choice. But they do have the terrain advantage, so they can shoot down into the elves as they try to scramble up the hill. Also some Drake Broodlings and some Warg Riders in behind to support his ally through the middle as well. Albeit, the Elven Force is not going to be too great going through the middle, so I don't know if WK and his ally over there, Froggy, is going to, going to need to marshal this with quite as much strength as they thought, but we shall see. Plenty of uh, twists and turns this battle can take. Black Uryx and Heavy Goblin Infantry, and another unit of Black Uryx. Speaking of which, let's move on to Froggy's army. He has got a Ballista, which is a really good thing to have here in the middle, actually. And he will be able to start opening fire on the few Elven units that are over here in this middle section. Heavy Goblin Spears, we've got some Heavy Goblin Infantry. Again, some very numerous units. Heavy Goblin Spears, more Heavy Goblin Infantry. We've got some Heavy Goblin Halberds. Goblin King's Bodyguard, I like the fact that all of the Goblin players are putting the general in the Goblin King's Bodyguard because it means you can utilise the hidden trait on the Blackback Berserkers if you want to bring that. Heavy Goblin Infantry and Spears in great numbers, some Heavy Goblin Crossbows up here as well. Uh, nothing in behind here that I can see, but the Goblins do have a few units that can hide. Warg Skirmishers as well going to be heading over to support Angmar, which is the player we're going to be seeing the battle from the perspective of, like I said, Tommy the Wise. So a big thank you to him for sending, presenting in this battle. Gundabad Guard here on the flanks. He has brought a unit of Snaga Archers. They are hidden for the time being. Um, as soon as they reveal themselves, though, they will be absolutely minced by the Imladris Archers. In behind them, however, Angmar are going to be quite resilient to skirmish fire in general. The Guardians of Khandun with their decent armour and their big shield value as long as they cover for the Witch Round Pikemen. They may have good armour for pikes, but being unshielded in the face of Elven Arrow Fire is not eh, exactly ideal. <coughs> Oh, something caught in my throat there. That was really unpleasant. Apologies for that. Which Ram Hammer Guard are here in the middle? I mean, they are a genuinely exceptional infantry unit, but perhaps here against Eclipse's army, they won't be quite as efficient as they would otherwise be, because Eclipse has gone for a rather unorthodox elven army. Well, at least with regards to Imladris. Scourge Raiders, on the other hand, could be exactly the ticket for bringing this elven army low by uh, rip ripping through those uh, spears and swords on the front line. Lightly armoured units do not do well against axe throwers, and the Scourge Raiders can even chip in in melee after the fact as part of a general advance. Gundabad Guard got some Orc Fallows who are hidden, and they should probably remain hidden if they do not want to get uh, ripped apart by Elven Archers. And then back here we have all of the truly exceptional stuff. We have two units, well, one unit of Trolls, we've got the Witches of Angmar, and then two units of Cavalry got the Warg Skirmishers and the Witch Realm Inquisitors, so plenty of anti-cavalry options on the field, like I said. Um, but this is going to be interesting. I'm not really sure what to make of this fight right from the off, because there are plenty of unorthodox builds, and this is an unorthodox kind of map as well. It's simultaneously wide open and yet also quite constricting. So uh, we'll have to wait and see how this, uh, how this pans out. But without further ado, we'll stay on this side of the battlefield, because I imagine this is where we're going to get underway. Um, let's get underway, shall we? I really do think that the early stages of this game are going to be all important really in terms of how, what sort of fight we're going to see and you can actually see the ballista here is going to be the thing that gets things underway first and foremost and there are some elder runway spearmen right out here in the open, a very high value target, kind of fortunate that they didn't go through the entirety of the unit there for Lango but even still a potential problem awaits. They don't have that many units in the middle anyway so it's clearly not a huge priority for them but they do still need to save what units that they can, or where they can. Noritino Cavalry moving forward meanwhile from Eclipse. He's going to tag the side of those pikemen there, and he's also going to charge into the spears. I mean, he's going to get the initial charge off, I suppose, which is going to kill some of the Gundabad guard, but on the retreat, those Noritino Cavalry are going to get a lot of damage done to them, especially with the Witch Realm Inquisitors on the way forward. So testing the lines, but Noritinos aren't really going to be up to too much 
Yes, the archers are pushing forward, but this is a bit of a weird setup, I must be honest, with the Witch Ram Inquisitors. In fact, I think immediately what we're going to do is start going down to half speed, because with the battle being as wide as it is, we're going to miss an awful lot, and I'm really not sure what Eclipse was thinking here, if I'm being honest. I mean, the Noratino Cavalry can act as sort of a screen for the archers to push forward and try and reveal what elements of the Angmar army may very well have been hidden, but the Noratino Cavalry is never going to be really fit for purpose when it comes to battling with Angmar Cavalry in pure melee. The Gwaithi Rockdor might be a slightly different proposition, but we shall see. Meanwhile, over here, we can see... Go back up to one speed, actually. We're going to be flicking back and forth quite a lot between them. I think that Morris's army was moving forward, but now he does move backwards. The Heavy Goblin Archer starting to shoot down the hill towards him. I mean, his army isn't massive either, Morris, so he does need to be a bit careful with what he decides to do. I mean, once again, we're seeing the archers go out in front. Fortunately for them, there's no real cavalry over here, but they could be intercepted by cave trolls as the Cardlan army also gets into position. A bit of a weird approach right here from the off with perhaps a little bit more of a skirmish option being adopted by the red team on this occasion. Greenway Garrison Spearman thinking of moving forwards, but if they're on their own, they're not really going to be able to achieve too much. Gen Moon will move forward with the Snaga Skirmishes as well. I mean, the Snaga Skirmishes need to be a bit careful. One of the few targets that the Greenway Garrison Spearmen will feel fairly confident against in melee, really. There's also cavalry there. I mean, they're so cheap, the Javelins, but even then, you'd want to use them on a unit better, potentially, than the Greenway Garrison Spears if you were at all able to. Well, again, I really don't think that the terrain is on Morris's side for doing this sort of thing. You can see that there are plenty of volleys coming in. I think those were. Yeah, more Heavy Goblin Archers. Plenty of that sort of ammunition coming in. Snaga Skirmishers. I mean, the Gwaithi Rockdor are moving forward. This is a pretty good catch from them. And they'll be able to kill off some of the Snaga. I think the idea maybe was to use them as bait and try and trap the cavalry in with the Heavy Goblin Spears, but hasn't really worked out that way in the end. I mean, the Elven Arrows will do a fair amount of damage to these goblins, but there are so many of them, and like I said, the terrain really isn't on the elf side, nor is the numbers. They keep taking damage at the hands of low-end skirmishers like the Heavy Goblin Arch. It's really not going to go in Morris's favour here, and WK can afford to take the damage that the Elven Archers are dishing out for the moment. Well, Eclipse over here isn't being bullied by the Angmaran Cavalry in the way that maybe he could have been. It would have been... Would have put Angmar on the front foot, and maybe that's the problem. Maybe Tommy the Wise doesn't want to be on the front foot so much. I mean, Angmar typically wants to be the aggressor. And with all of the archers, maybe Eclipse was hoping to force Angmar into that role. I mean, the terrain over here for the elves is not that bad. They've got some good high ground in behind they can use some supporting units. The Amladris quality, of course, can be pretty good if you lure the enemy in to your front line. So, a bit of a standoff so far over here. Neither side wanting to be overtly aggressive. That will change, I'm sure. Meanwhile, the elves have claimed the high ground over here. Two units of Swords of Rivendell to cover the one unit of archers that is up here. And damage will be being done to the goblins down there. Going after Heavy Goblin Halberds, a unit that is very vulnerable to missile fire of this type. Meanwhile, we are seeing the first of the melee engagements, and it is Gen Mumu lurching forward to try and attack Cardlan. Not the worst idea, perhaps. Two factions which Larger on numbers, certainly more fragile on morale, on both sides of the morality spectrum. Heavy Goblin Halberds will help the initial fight here against the Greenway units, so they're going to need to get some of those footmen in, some pikes to help shore things up, and the danger here, potentially, for the Misty Mountains is that they don't commit enough units forward, and in so doing, their initial assault may fall apart, and then all of a sudden they've got significantly less units, significantly less numbers, to deal with a potential Cardlan counter-attack, and Cardlan will want to use those missiles mentioned in the army composition phase to level the playing field in terms of those numbers. Heavy Goblin Halberds will do pretty well against these Greenway Spears, but they won't do quite so well if the crossbow bolts start raining in. They're also being backed up by a unit of pretty genuine quality in the Mountain Mountainera Coast, so this isn't just a flash-in-the-pan kind of assault for Cardlan. They do need to take it seriously. The Hiriath Men at Arms being pushed onto the front line They'll do well against Heavy Goblin units, but against the Uruk divisions that the Misty Mountains can feel, it's significantly less clear how well they're going to end up doing. I don't know. Do they have the angles as well, Cardland, to be able to use their missiles? They've got plenty of supporting units, but so many of them are those missile units. Not taking advantage either side of this little side passage yet, but the Misty Mountains could attack through there as well. 
heavy goblin halberds are steady for the time being. They're going to get partially charged into here by the Royal Courthouse, the Rondor. Lance is down. A lot of damage can potentially be done, but it wasn't a really clean charge where the morale is potentially going to tumble quickly. And the, you, know, you can see that the depletion of the Greenway units very quickly is leading to routing on the part of Cardlan. And with this momentum, the Misty Mountains could carry it forward and try and scour Cardlan from the field effectively. Meanwhile, down here, Morris. It would have been tempting for me if I were in Morris's position to not bother trying to go up here at all. Maybe go right round the back and directly reinforce Cardland, perhaps. It would leave the middle a little bit open, but I would be willing to take the risk that the blue team would maybe not be willing to attack into the middle in that fashion. Over here, we've got some wargs pushing up the hill. I mean, this is some extreme terrain they've got going on here. Swords of Rivendell blocking the advance of the Heavy Goblin infantry. Of course, the Swords of Rivendell will be very much at home in a melee fight against these lowly heavy goblins. Uh, they are going to pull back a little bit though, maybe a little bit exposed to missiles in the position they're currently in if they move backwards a little bit. Uh, they'll be able to use the terrain and the geography of the map to their advantage. Meanwhile, over here, still playing tag with one another by the looks of things, are uh, Angmar and this in Madras army. The drum Inquisitor's coming forward and charging in once again. I mean, it does look as though Imladris have had the worst of these engagements so far. I mean, there's not that many dead bodies over on this side of the field. There are a few, but even over here, quite a lot of it is the Noritino cavalry. And slowly but surely, I can't help but feel as though Imladris are being bled dry. And even the Snagar archers have managed to join in on the fun. And because they can go back into hiding, it's kind of difficult for Imladris to actually skirmish back and forth with them. But I don't think it's gone all that well so far for Imladris over on this side. And with the Misty Mountains also gaining the momentum over on the other flank of the battlefield and nothing really happening too much in the middle. I have to say, it's the forces of evil that have started this battle off the better so far. The heavy Goblin infantry being backed up by war skirmishers, so those javelins may be proving to be a bit of a potential issue, which is why Lango pulling back with the swords and his archers. Those javelins could have done a lot of damage to the exposed units after all. Well, Imladris are getting into position now, potentially Seeing an opportunity to attack in full force with their quality, and WK's front line would certainly be tested if that were the case. It would also be an aggressive move, which would potentially change up how this battle is going so far, so I do approve of it. Wifey Rockdor going to squeeze around here. What are they going to go after? The cave trolls could look to block their potential advance. Trolls in melee with cavalry is not going to be good for the cavalry, but again, in this sort of environment as well, it's not going to be easy to get a charge. Here is the ballista. Ooh right through the ranks of those units there into the god helium as well. This is probably going to hurry Morris up a little bit. It has been slow progress up the hill, but now we're going to see another large clash. So more of the melee action is happening over on this side of the battlefield so far. Across come the Drake Broodlings as well. I mean, you can't really pull back with your Gwythe Rockdor at this point, otherwise you're going to allow the Drake Broodlings to start munching into the side of your front line, which is now committed. This is a large commitment of units, including the Imladris sentries. Cave Trolls are moving in as well, Drake Broodlings. I mean, perhaps in sustained melee against those Spears of Rivendell, they won't be too happy, but the potential of maybe routing an Imladris front line against the Goblin one is too great a prize to pass up, surely. The God Hellion continue to fire. They're going after the artillery, but the damage may already be being done. They will finish off that artillery at some stage soon. Meanwhile, over yonder. Heavy Goblin Halberds are shaken. In come the Mercenary Guildsmen. The Snow Trolls have managed to get in behind enemy lines. I mean, there's a lot of infantry here to the point where the Trolls are probably going to fall away pretty quickly, including a little bit of armor piercing, which will help. But just the fact that their line's integrity has been compromised in this way is probably a bad sign. But both sides with shaken units, who can uh, stay in the fight for longer? That is the question. I mean, here we have the units, Heavy Goblins. Heavy cavalry of Cardan also wading into combat. Mountain Uruk coast defeat seems set for them. Even the Mountain Uruks starting to become a little bit shaken up. Snaga skirmishers trying to offer what support they can to the Goblin front line. Just in behind. I mean, over time it's hard to tell as 
as usual with missiles how effective they are actually being, but with so many crossbows you have to assume that the Misty Mountains are going to be taking substantial damage over time. It's just whether or not Cardland's front line can hold long enough for that damage to be all conquering. I mean, they're using their cavalry a little bit more freely than it seems like the Misty Mountains are using their Bolg's champion, but there is a downside to that. And you don't really want the Royal Court House to Rondor stuck in melee with these Hellbirds for too long. He's just wading in here, surely. This is going to be bad news for them. I mean, they route the Heavy Goblin Hellbirds, though, so... Bold, but successful. Intriguing. Let's see what's happening over here then, because it looks as though Cardinal is starting to turn the tide a little bit against Jan Mumu's army over there. It doesn't look like the same could be said of Morris's front line. And this front line over here has been significantly damaged. The Gwaithi Rockdor trying to gain entry into the backfield. There's not too many cave trolls left alive. The Gwaithi Rockdor proving to be a real problem, but the Snaga Skirmish is not able to do the damage that they would want, but so it's a little bit difficult for the Gwaithi Rockdor to get up ahead of steam of their own. A little bit entrapped so far, you would have to say. It's still the Riders of the Bruinen, but... I don't know, it seems like Morris has been in a constant battle to not be positionally on the back foot in this battle, and if he can start pushing WK back, then he will get what he wants, but what, at what cost will it be? Black Oryx, the mountains coming in there, better suited for fighting Elven units than most. Going up against some Norantino warriors there. Still not a great deal of action happening in the middle, but then so exposed for both teams, it's not too surprising to see that that is the case. Meanwhile, looks as though we are going to see more of a fight happening over here. What on earth was that? That was clearly the Witchers. The Witchers have done a lot of damage to various units, which I think included a bit of friendly fire, to be honest. There are Gundabad Guard in here, but surely most of this damage is Elven. And those in Landris centuries, yeah, only 36 of them remaining, so. Not entirely sure where the witches are now. Maybe they are. Maybe they have perished. Very difficult map to see the witches on actually because of the dark backgrounds. So they can blend in even more easily. But more bad news for the elves over here, really. And now with an attack as well from Angmar going forward. Maybe a mutual attack as the elves have lurched forward a little bit themselves. But that witcher volley could prove to be really, really important. Over here, where the witchers haven't had much of an impact, you'd have to say that the elves are in the ascendancy, though. Even the witcher on Hammergard is struggling, given the fact that the elves have got their pikes in position over here, and Ladris Guardians also helping to shore things up. Elven cavalry is behind enemy lines, Hammer and Anvilling as well. Gwythi Rockdor is not what you want to see if you're Angmar. You're going to have to hope that your pikes can do a good amount of damage to them. Which um, Scourge Raid is potentially going to try and do the business. Javelins going in, trying to quickly kill off the Gwythi Rock Door before they can do extreme amounts of damage. I mean, the Witcher Ram Inquisitors should just be trying to chase them into the nether regions of the map. The more that you can stop those Elven supporting units, the more that your numerous and heavy infantry line for Angmar can try and gain a handle on the situation and start pushing back against the Elven quality that is on display on the front line. The trolls are in here. And the Trolls are a pretty good choice for going after those Elven Pikes. They're bogged down, really, in, in and amongst the more melee infantry elements of this force. Well, there are the Witchers, and they are taking uh, missile fire now, including some Imladris Guardians that were in behind enemy lines as well. I mean, the damage is already potentially done. The, witch, the Witchers have already got a really good volley onto this Elven flanking force, which for Lango is probably going to fall apart. With some reinforcements from Froggy over here, Angmar could be onto a winning thing, but he is, he is going to need those reinforcements, because if he doesn't get them... Uh, I think he is going to ultimately end up coming out second best against that Elven quality that is on the front line. Gundabad Guard trying to finish off the units that were so heavily damaged by the Witchers. Meanwhile, way back over on the other side, Black Oryx the Mountains. It looks as though it is the Misty Mountains that are running out of steam on this side. Attacking into Cardland, that support from Cardland from the Cavalry and from the Crossbowmen seems to have done the trick. Snaga Skirmish is trying to offer some support of their own, but... They weren't able to smash Cardland to pieces as quickly as they needed to, really, and it was a fairly narrow pass to try and do that in any way. So maybe they always were doomed. Still no advance happening from that side. I Minhiriath mean, Archers trying to use their flaming shot, so sensing a bit of weakness here is Mevan trying to rout off what remains of the Misty Mountains army over here. I think actually we could probably go up to one speed from here. Snaga Skirmish is still doing their thing. The Royal Court House of Rondor could try and get in behind enemy lines and finish off what remains of the soft and squishy 
Misty Mountain's javelins, and that is exactly what they're going to try and do. Very effective use of the Royal Court House of the Rondor in a fight where cavalry is not necessarily the easiest thing to use. So very well done from that perspective. But how are Imladris getting on over here? Are they also turning this fight around? It does not look like it. WK looks to be turning Imladris back one, well and truly. Blackback Berserkers and Heavy Goblin Spears engaging with the God Helim in melee. The front line that initial hit from the Drake Broodlings has allowed the Misty Mountains to start crunching in from the side, which the Imladris sentries are holding up for now, but getting recharged by the Blackback Berserkers isn't going to help their case at all. Elder Enway Archers being committed to melee to try and shore things up in terms of quality, but just the numbers that WK is bringing down upon Morris, and the fact that Morris, again, has been on the back foot for most of this fight, just sort of scrambling to get up this hill. Uh, it's probably not going to go all that well from Ladras, so we may see the remnants of WK and Mevan's armies have to fight it out over here to see who can truly win this side of the battlefield. There is still the potential, of course, that these riders of the Bruining can do some good damage to those blackbacks, but they're also going to get chased off by some infantry as we speak. Snow Trolls moving over here, trying to deal with the Gwaiti Rock Lord that are in behind enemy lines. This is actually Eclipse's unit coming all the way over here, trying to go after some squishier targets perhaps, getting away from the Witch Round Inquisitors. They do charge in there, some good damage, but wouldn't it be more useful to have them over here? And you can see here that it looks as though they're winning on this side. Angmar doing really well in places. They're looking like there was there's some green smoke rising, which is usually the sign that the Witchers have committed a volley or two. Angmar's numbers here seem to have done the trick. Meanwhile, Witch Ram Inquisitors against the Gwaithi Rockdor. Gwaithi Rockdor with the numbers advantage, though, and with a bit of ranged support coming in, means they will probably be victorious here against uh, the against the Witch Ram Inquisitors. Meanwhile, yeah, Imladris routing off, looking pretty bad, honestly. But the forces of good over on this side. Witcher volleys. The initial fight where both sides were bleeding one another out, certainly going in favour of the forces of evil, which Eclipse will probably be really disappointed with, given the fact that he had a much higher archer investment. He wasn't really able to get a handle on the fight, even from a ranged perspective. Um, and it has been one-way traffic. Over on this side, with Froggy also committing forward plenty of reinforcements as well. Well here in the middle. Maybe a desperate attack forward from Lango to try and make something happen, but Froggy still has a portion of his army over here to marshal things as well. Yes, the Boyan and River Wards will be pretty dominant against most goblin units, but they're going to have to chew their way through an awful lot, and even if they do end up winning, that'll be pretty much the sum total of their contribution in this map, I would have thought. Back over here, Elder Enway, I mean, plenty of units over here. Goblin King's bodyguard, so Froggy's general being used to plug the gap alongside a unit of ever decreasing Goblin infantry. I mean, this will end up going in the forces of good's favour, this fight in the middle. Like I said, it's unlikely to be all that decisive given there aren't that many units involved in it. Who knows, though, lots of the Misty Mountains general can be, can be pretty uh, devastating. Well. I mean, there are parts of this Elven army which are doing pretty well, crunching in from the side against these Witch Round Pikemen. There's still some Elven Pikes left alive, a charge coming in from the Wargs. Decent charge as well, the Pikes obviously not pointing in the right direction, so that is a good spot there from WK, his Warg Riders doing the business, attacking the Elves where they are at their strongest over on the side. And there goes an Elven General, killed off by one of those Warg Riders. Unfortunate, Lango trying to salvage the situation, but his general already damaged and paying the price there. Which I'm scared, Raiders being victorious over here, being used as melee infantry. Two units of uh, ranged infantry that also have dual weapon capabilities in melee, and the Scourge Raiders look to be winning there. Meanwhile, over here is this surely the death raffles of Jan Mumu's army. Riders finished off by the Greenway Spears. Will Cup House to Rondor almost completely spent at this point, but very well used. Cardland's army looking in pretty decent condition actually in terms of numbers, but quite a lot of their army as the battle goes along is going to be made up of skirmishes that are out of ammunition. In the case of their crossbows, that's not too bad, but in the case of the Minheriath archers, not going to be the greatest in terms of the quality that they do bring to the table, but 
We'll see how it goes. Victory almost a certainty. Victory seems certain. Only a fool could lose this battle. Cardinal going to have to help out their elven allies. It doesn't really look like Imladris are having too much luck anywhere else on the battlefield, really. Certainly not in a sweeping capacity like Cardinal have had over here. Meanwhile, one thing that you can always guarantee on with the elves, though, is that they're not going to go down easily. There goes Jen Mumu's general. Even when they are almost certainly going to lose, they are going to take a little bit more beating than most other factions. The God Helene facing off against... Well, that's a little bit unfortunate there for Cardinal, though, losing their general like that. That could have a bearing later on when Cardinal will need to do some heavy lifting for their team. As we're saying, these God Helene facing off against some Uruks and some Goblin Halberdiers. Well, down here, on the low ground, Goblin King's bodyguard fighting hard. I mean, they will take some killing. Basic swords, even elite spears with that spear malice. I mean, they're going to lose based on the position. They're utterly surrounded, but... Pretty tanky, you'd have to say. Meanwhile, over here, some archers of Rimdell out of ammunition coming in to support the Bruin in River Wards, who did need that backup in terms of the numbers. Some very depleted cavalry here. Gwythi rocked or Froggy taking a charge from Eclipse's General, and Eclipse's General killed off by one of those goblin spears. In a typical fashion, perhaps, you could say. Mm. Froggy with some of his units over here as well, helping WK finish. Morris's army off. Morris still has some of those Riders of the Bruin in charging in there to the Blackback Berserkers. Not sure how much damage they're necessarily going to do, but they're trying their best. Meanwhile, Angmar look to have been utterly victorious over here. Trolls of Gundabad. Yeah, Froggy's army moving forward as well to scour Eclipse's army from these positions. They will be able to move around to surround. I really don't see how the forces of good come back into this at this point. Cardlin will need to form up a pretty bulky defence in some sort of position on the map. There goes Morris's general. I think at this point the numbers, the momentum, too great for the orcs and goblins fighting on home turf here. They'll be able to surround this position. They won't be victorious before more units arrive. I mean, Mountain Orc Berserkers have arrived on scene, taking the long way around, going up against the Swords of Rimgar. Their armor piercing won't be all that useful against a unit such as this, but you'll take what you can get. It's getting some units in support of your ever dwindling general's bodyguard, the Elder Runway Spearman, certainly doing the business against them, but it was really just to distract these units, I suppose. And now with wargs on the way, more Snaga skirmishers, another unit that's been used very well. And the early portions of the battle did prove to be fairly decisive. The elves, in particular, never really gained a handle on the situation. Cardinal were able to remain solid even in the face of initial worries against the Misty Mountains Assault, but ever since then, you have to say, Dummy came moving forward, so Cardlin. I think at this point, Mevin will probably be looking across at the rest of the battlefield and worrying a little bit because it seems like he's the only one from his team that's been victorious. Morris's army been pushed firmly way back down the hill with his units routing. Eclipse and Langer on the other side, their varying compositions, their unorthodox compositions and the way that the battle started off with the skirmish fight not really going to plan. Um, really didn't end too well for them. Bruin Rewards trying to chase off those wargs. Trolls of Gundabad moving in, and with all these reinforcements now arriving, actually Froggy's general may very well end up surviving this. Heavy Goblin Halberds moving in, the Elder and West Beaman are routing. A charge coming in, that might be enough. Elven morale is very, very good, but... They know when they're beaten, I think. At this point, though, the chance of you escaping from these caves intact is probably fairly limited, so you may as well just go down swinging. started wavering more when the wards left combat. Still 36 Bruin in River Wards. 
trolls doing their thing, drawing in river wards. Actually lasted longer than the Elder Enway Spearmen, just about, but both of them do route more or less in unison. And the elves will now be pushed away. So I think that is the last, really, of the elven presence that's fighting on the field. Maybe a few units over here. Yeah, Lango still has some of his archers fighting. Heavy Goblin Infantry chasing some of those swords. And the archers of Rivendell will likely stay in melee a little bit longer. They're only up against Snaga after all. I think this is the last of the elven combatants that is in not in active retreat. And at that point it will be all up to the middlemen of Cardland to see if they can really try and pull something spectacular out of the bag here to win it for the forces of good. I have my doubts. If that wasn't already clear. <laughs> Not sure where all of these heavy double infantry are going, taking the very long way around potentially. I mean, they're going to be able to surround Cardinal at their leisure, basically, the attackers. I'd say the attackers, the force of evil. If anything, the, uh, the orcs and the goblins were the defenders in this particular battle. No, they're not. They are going to continue routing. Probably going to go right past their comrades who are getting bullied by Snaga and all things. How embarrassing for them. Meanwhile, Cardland moving forward in one big lump, really, and they're going to be able to finish off remnants of Froggy's units that are over here, including Blackback Berserkers. Definitely not the worst thing they could isolate and finish off. Getting stun locked into oblivion. So way back over there. Those look like trolls in the distance, if I had to guess. Indeed, they are snow trolls. It's like a very violent confrontation over here. I mean, WK has spent a long time getting around that position on the field, but they will be able to trap themselves now, or trap this Cardan army between WK's remaining forces and. The advancing forces from Angmar. Khan are going to try and get back into a defensive shape of some description. Still that individual fight going on over here? There is. Arch of the I don't think there's enough of them at this point. There's simply too many Snaga and they're going to be overwhelmed. That horde mentality coming into effect. This is the only active fight happening on the field with Cardinal trying to scurry back into position. What have we got going on here? Riders of the Bruinen, so I guess, no, there is an Elven asset still active on the field. Morris has still got a very depleted unit of cavalry that he can use as outriders to the main Cardinal force, and they are going to squeeze themselves into this narrow canyon. And that's all well and good. I mean, they've got some infantry to hold the line with, but... I don't know if they've necessarily got the quality. I mean, I think the Gatekeepers are actually the strongest unit that they have from a melee standpoint. I'm not sure whether that's going to be enough. Maybe it will. I've seen stranger things happen, but based on the numbers, 4% in favour of the Orcs and Goblins. So that should be enough for them to go on to win, to be honest. I think they still have the quality edge as well, with units like the Blackback still active. Don't know if the Hammer Guard were utterly destroyed during that heroics against Imladris or not, but I'm sure we shall find out. Victory seems certain. Only a fool could lose this battle. Uh, I don't know about that. I think they're going to end up looking a little bit foolish. This is the. In terms of singular fights, this is probably the one that we've seen the most in this battle, ironically enough, between these two. Units that should never really be seeing melee combat. Meanwhile, Riders of the Bruinen going out wide. What will they be able to charge into? Blackback Berserkers, perhaps? I mean, they'll almost certainly die in the ensuing melee, but maybe they can do the business. Off the charge. Ooh, 49 Hammer Guard. Are they at least bloodied and bruised? Yeah. But 49 Hammer Guard is going to be difficult with all of this support. Yeah, I think Cardland may very well be doomed. They do charge into the Goblin King's bodyguard, trying to kill off maybe Froggy's general, but they follow that up with a swift volley from the heavy goblin crossbows. And this will surely be the end of 
Morris's contribution to this battle. Bit of a clumsy bumping into the unit there. Unless they could get friendly fire on their own general as well, that would be most unfortunate. Snarga Skirmish is moving forward as Cardlan form up their last stand in this narrow pass. Orcs, Goblin Spears, plenty of corpses. Cardlan did really well actually to win that fight in the way they did, and clearly it came about as a result of the support that they had in place with their crossbows and the like, the Snarga Skirmishers. A real hero unit, to be honest, for the uh, forces of evil in this battle. Very good use of cheap javelins. And over here, it's sort of slow but inevitable, the setting up of this sandwich-like assault from the orcs and goblins, guardians of Khandum, four of them, Snaga archers. I mean, to be fair, there's not too much of the rank-and-file Angmar units left after their bruising encounter with Imladris on that front line. 61 Scourge Raiders with axes and cutlasses drawn. Froggy's army lagging behind Angmar just a little bit. Maybe they're going to start to get a little bit twitchy and attack anyway. Looks as though that's what's going to be happening with WK. Snaga Skirmishers getting into position. And they will be able to just throw javelins at almost point blank range into the waiting Cardlan shield wall. Sharpshooters, I mean, they are macemen. Surely there's not enough of them left, but. Mm. What are they actually shooting at? So, yeah, I think they, they have identified the fact that the gatekeepers are the best Cardinal infantry units, so they're going to try and go after them kill off as many of them as they can with the javelins and even if they miss they're going to hit something and at this point just extend the likelihood that they are going to be the ones to go on to win this and it's going to force Cardlin into some sort of counter attack here against the Misty Mountains Shark to charging in, they will catch the Snaga in melee but now the trolls, the Goblin King's bodyguard and the Black Oryx, the Mountains will also come into melee far more suited to this kind of melee combat, and this will also be the trigger I would suggest for Tommy the Wise to move forward with what remains of his Angmar and to attack on the other side, and that is going to be happening. And this is it, the final thousand frames will see Cardinal's last stand, and they'll probably initially do a fair amount of damage to stuff like the Heavy Goblin Infantry, fill their boots in terms of kills a little bit more, but the Snow Trolls are going to cause some havoc in there. They don't really have enough damage dealers to deal with something like the Snow Trolls at this point. Only the Gatekeepers are really going to be capable of dishing out that AP damage that they need quickly enough. I mean, here we have Sharpshooters marshalling the other side against Angmar as the Scourge Raiders and Snaga Archers move forward in the initial attack. The Halberds go down. Surely that, yeah, there's a route over there. The gatekeeper's trying to go back and forth between the two lines, but they can't be everywhere all at once. And this is going to be it. A grisly end for the brave man of Cardolan. Broadcourt House of Rondor still alive. Another unit, in terms of a singular unit, that has done extremely well in this fight. And they will be here to the bitter, bitter end. That's not Berserkers moving in as well. So yeah, it's going to be, I mean, it will be around 10% of the difference. Almost like the perfect margin of victory here for the Orcs and Goblins. Javelin's still being thrown, Manitar Roman Gatekeeper's broken. It's always a bad sign, and here we are Sharp Chiefs as well. So, Walk Up House Sarondor actually will be the last ones left, I think. They are thinking of, well, they were thinking of routing for a little while there. Trying to kill off a couple more Goblins before they get laid low. No, they have broken and are fighting to the death, so there must be something else on the field which is not. Where are we? Aha! Probably a unit of like one or so that we can't see. More I mean, this is pretty much the sum total of what the orcs and goblins have left, so it's not all that much considering the sheer size of the Misty Mountains armies at the start of this battle. 
good amount of back and forth, but the initial fights, Angmar and the Misty Mountains simply won too many of them, and it didn't go to plan enough, especially for the Emladris armies, you'd have to say, um, for the forces of good to be able to go on to win this one. Um, but it was still an interesting one, because you always got the sense that there was always a possibility that the, the uh, Imladris Cardinal Alliance could maybe have rallied at some point. If they'd found a gap, maybe a couple of charges, even the ones that we didn't see, maybe could have been enough to turn things around. But in the end, it was not the case. Um, Morris getting a lot of kills there, but even still with that, you, he never really got into a position where he forced WK off of his pedestal. Jen Mumu moved forward very aggressively, good amount of kills for him. Um, the only member of his team really to not win that initial fight um, but even then he did enough damage to Cardlam that it didn't really matter too much and he was still a contributing factor to the battle obviously Angmar, the Witchers, we saw the aftermath of two shots from the Witchers which were very critical against the Eclipse and Lano efforts over on the other side of the field and they never really recovered from that like the Imladris front line does what it does in the sense that in places they were doing really well against Angmar because of their quality but they weren't able to blanket that across the entirety of the map due to the losses that they've taken. And if you can't do that, eventually you're just going to get surrounded and overwhelmed by more numbers-focused factions like Angmar, but especially the Misty Mountains with the support that Froggy was giving to Tommy the Wise. And it worked. I think that in the end, based on the interplay, the, the um, forces of evil were the worthy victors in this fight. So yeah, let's see what did the damage for the Angmar in. The Witchers getting 278 kills, of course, and based on the fact that most of them would have been against pretty decent Imladris forces... It's obviously going to be high quality kills, which Ram Inquisitors were very useful as well, given the kind of bizarre cavalry engagements we saw early on and as the battle continued. I mean, like I said, in the composition phase, this map is kind of strange in the sense that it's equal parts open and sweeping, but also very constricting um, and limiting in terms of what you can do with that sort of thing. So it could have gone either way. I mean, we saw really good cavalry and bad cavalry play in this in this battle. I mean, the Witch Ram Inquisitors were always going to be more defensive anyway. So Tommy the Wise can afford to be fairly pleased with that. Guardians of Khandoom, differing fortunes. That's always going to be the case against an elven force. The Hammer Guard did really well, I have to say, given the fact that they were going up against elves. It is worth saying that Eclipse's army was somewhat unorthodox in the sense that it had much more of the entry-level Imladris units than maybe we're used to seeing, um, which are going to struggle to do damage against something as, as deadly as the Hammer Guard. But, um, and then the Hammer Guard can obviously do a lot of damage in return. But even so... Scourge Raiders did well, Orc Fellers not so well, but that's not too surprising. Pikeman, you know, that's a good performance for which run Pikeman, given the quality of opposition they were going up against. But yeah, I also feel as though the compositions of the evil team here were probably more well put together. I mean, they're easier to a certain extent. I mean, Angmar's composition was maybe a little bit off the beaten path in terms of what they brought, like a little bit of a smaller army focused around more supporting tools and some mounted units, which could have gone wrong for Tommy the Wise. It didn't, but it could have. Um, meanwhile, the Misty Mountains, it's very typical from what you'd expect from them. Like There were some differences in terms of the proportion of upper-end units, like Mountain Uruks and Black Uruks, to Heavy Goblin units. Definitely some differences there. But for the most part, the Misty Mountains is an army which you can pretty much nail down um, as an opposition to it most of the time. Whereas I think the compositions for the Elven factions here probably didn't work out in the way they wanted. Eclipse going for something a little bit different. It didn't work, you'd have to say. I think the initial Noritino cavalry attacks didn't really go to plan. His archer heavy focus didn't really go to plan. His infantry did okay, but there simply wasn't enough of it. Morris went for a more quality focus build, but he was never really able to escape from the position he was in. Um, trying to push his way uphill into all of those numbers from WK and then obviously a little bit of support from Froggy. Froggy not having to marshal the middle of the map um, with all of his army meant he could go to the aid of both Tommy and WK with some of his units. So while he got the fewest amount of kills, he was definitely a real help in shoring up his allies and making sure they won those two critical fights, which obviously put the uh, put the Imladris Cardlan alliance into a hole that they could not ultimately escape from, despite Mevin's best efforts. So yeah, big thank you to Tommy the Wise for sending this one in. A big thank you to all of the players for being a part of the battle replay as well and allowing me to show it. As for what's moving forward, I think this may very well end up being the last video of 2021, I want to say. Um, based on what I'm thinking, I believe that will be the case, and uh, what a year it's been. Um, I probably already would have gone into all of that in a Christmas update video, which I haven't recorded yet, because at the moment it's very early December that I'm recording this battle replay on, um, whereas I, I want the 
the Christmas update video to be obviously a little bit closer to the, to the time so it's actually a little bit more legitimately a Christmas video um, but yeah probably already would have gone into that there's a lot of movement that could happen in 2022 as I'm sure I already would have mentioned in that video as well there's a lot of variables in play but one thing that I am determined to do is to make sure that the channel at the very least maintains its current level I would like to increase in some ways, which may be possible depending upon how it goes. Um, we'll, we'll have to wait and see. It's one of those things which is very much in flux. Uh, in the more immediate term, what's going to be happening? There is going to be another Rise of Mordor video focusing on the Top 5 Shock Cavalry, which is going to be coming out in very early 2022. One of the first videos that we see. Probably a few more Silmarillion replays that are in the backlog, and obviously the Reforged content will continue to flow as it has. Other than that, the new hardware question, that will probably be in early spring, probably looking at March to maybe get that into play. So all my PC needs to do is stay alive throughout the rest of December, January and February, and then it can finally be retired, put out to pasture, and we can uh, and we can get a new PC on the go. And then maybe we can start doing large-scale Rise of Mordor replays as well, because I think I would be able to actually do them justice then with some new hardware. Maybe we can even make a return to Moria, which has been... Uh, very weirdly uh, broken ever since uh, ever since the summer but yeah very weird regardless of that big thank you to Tommy the Wise once again thank you to all the players hope you enjoyed this and I hope you will join me for whatever is next